Hello and welcome to this Unlocked Budget Special. My name is Dominic Frisby and with me in the studio today is businessman and chairman of Unlocked, Ben Habib. So, the UK economy. Unemployment currently stands at over 5%, with another 6 million roughly, around one-fifth of the workforce on furlough. Yet, house prices are at all-time highs, propped up on a wave of funny money. Interest rates are at all-time lows. The inequality gap is bigger than ever. The money printers are going brrrr like never before. The government has borrowed 400 billion this year. That is eight times more than they borrowed in 2019, which takes the national debt to 2.1 trillion pounds. That works out at roughly 30,000 pounds each, including kids. We bandy these numbers about, but we forget just how big a trillion is. A trillion is a million millions. There are 12 zeros in a trillion. I could spend a million pounds every day since the day that Jesus was born, and I still would not have spent a trillion pounds. And our national debt is two trillion. And yet they say there is no inflation. Ten years ago, if I wanted a yield of five grand a year, the bond would have cost me a hundred grand. Now it costs me a million. The whole thing stinks of government meddling in the economy and making an almighty mess. And this week we have the budget. The Tories have done their usual thing of leaking a hundred different rumours. Income tax is going to go up. Council tax is going up. Capital gains tax is going to go up. Are they doing it to get a feel for public opinion? Or are they doing it to scare the crap out of everyone so that when the inevitable tax rises come and they're not quite as bad as everyone says they were going to be, people feel relieved instead of angry? Ben, what do you think is going on? Well, we've definitely got a magic money tree and they've tapped it because they couldn't otherwise afford to do what they needed to do last year. And as you rightly pointed out, we increased our borrowing last year by 400, did you say 450 billion appro approximately? I think it's 400 billion, but it's 400 billion, what's 50, 50, billion, what's 50 between? billion between friends. And all of that effectively has come from the Bank of England that has printed the money to buy that government debt. So in reality, if you regard the Bank of England as part of the state, it's the left hand giving to the right hand, and the right hand being the government then spending it somehow on lockdowns. It's just a sleight of hand. It's, 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 it's monetising debt. It's monetising debt. They refuse to acknowledge it. Andrew Bailey keeps saying, no, no, we're not monetising debt. But that's precisely what they've done. And it's no accident that in 2008, 2009, the amount of money printed by the Bank of England exactly matched what the government raised. And it's no accident that the figure matches again last year. And, you know, this is the point in a sense. What they've done, Dominic, without jumping ahead perhaps in this debate, is they've robbed people of the value of cash and they've inflated the value of assets. So those of us who own assets, stock market shares, bonds, houses, office blocks, are getting richer. And those of us who've live from hand to mouth and have sh small deposits in banks that we've saved up over a million, uh, not a million years, but over a number of years, have diminished in value. So they're hitting the working and middle classes the hardest and enriching the rich. I think billionaire wealth has tripled this year. Has it? Something OK, well, like that. there you go. That says it all, doesn't it? But I mean, it? that counts, uh, you know, Silicon, yeah. Valley, Silicon Valley tech Uber yeah. laws, but <laughs> it's the same process. Now... You did a wonderful thing in your Ben at 10 piece this morning. Thank you. Uh, explaining about why you think these rumours about tax rises are going about and what's going to happen with tax rises. Tell us, tell us what you said there. Yeah, well, it's typical Conservative Party behaviour. You know, they're run by the polls. They don't provide leadership. They judge what is popular and then they act accordingly. So, as you said, they've been trailing a whole load of possible tax rises, none of which, by the way, would even touch the sides of the problem if they were to implement them. But they've been running these hairs to determine where, you know, public opinion is on each one of these hairs. And the other thing that's going on, and it was really clear in Sophie Ridge yesterday when Rishi Sunak was put on the spot by her and he was asked, you know, we hear, I've heard that you said to MPs last week, Rishi, 
um, that you're going to put up taxes now so that you have the opportunity to cut them before the next election. And he, he, his face went blank. He was completely wrong footed. Sophie Rich, who's so gentle, so kind, never asks a penetrating question, typically, absolutely had him on the spot. And you could tell by his reaction that was what government policy was. They're going to raise taxes now, kick the economy in the shins when it's down, in order to get re-elected in 2024. It's typical Conservative Party behaviour. Fishy Rishi Sunak, not dishy <laughs> Rishi. This, when, I think in life, it's really important to have a philosophy. And Margaret Thatcher used to call this first principles. Now, whether, and, and religion in many cases can provide you with your philosophy, whether it's Christianity or Islam or Hinduism, or it might be that your philosophy is, is Marxism or your philosophy is Adam Smith and free markets. Whatever your philosophy is, it's important to have a philosophy so that when you are not sure what decision to make, you have a falling principle on which you can fall yeah. back on to guide you. Yeah. And I don't think in all, I mean, government's got steadily worse in all my lifetime. Yeah. And it was so apparent with the Tories under Theresa May, this party that does not stand for anything except getting re-elected. Yeah. It has no guiding principle. And I thought that was, in a way, what let Theresa May down, because, because she had no principle over Brexit. She was just pulled one way and one the other and ended up nowhere. But that illness has spread into the current government. I thought Boris Johnson was sort of, broadly speaking, was a classical liberal who stood for low taxes and individual responsibility and generally less of the state. But every decision this Conservative Party have had to make from HS2 to, to, to every decision throughout the corona cri crisis, every decision has led to more government, big states, more state, big states. and not less states. Absolutely. He talks a libertarian sort of drumbeat, but actually the reality is he's an interventionist, an extreme interventionist. There's no Labour government I can think of that has intervened in the economy to the extent that the Conservative government has in the last year. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, he might say that it's extremist, it's a virus, we had to shut everything down. But just think about the sheer magnitude. Our total debt as a country 10 years ago was a trillion. We've added a trillion since then. And we're going to add another 500 billion probably this year. I'm rounding figures, but that's what's going to happen. And the extraordinary thing is that Labour is now talking about low taxes and reigning in spending. <laughs> and all the Conservative strategists will go, it's great, we're owning the Labour Party, we've outwitted the Labour Party. But in doing so, the Tories have turned themselves into this vacuous shell of nothing. Yeah, massive state intervention, massive government spending, leading to higher taxes. That used to be the Labour Party. I heard Annalisa Dodd speaking yesterday, who hitherto I thought was economically illiterate. But she made a hell of a lot more sense than Rishi Sunak did. And where you, I would never have expected to feel that, to think that, that Annalisa Dodd would have it more clearly right than Rishi Sunak has. Now, we, uh, we began this show talking about the, uh, the magic money tree. And if you want to get an idea of just how vacuous the Conservatives are and just how they will use whatever arguments are available at the time to suit their political agenda. Let's look at this little clip now. They rem Remember, the Tories now, to get out of the situation they are in, are relying totally on modern monetary theory, the, the magic money tree. But this is what they said about MMT a couple of years ago. There isn't a magic money tree that we can shake that suddenly provides for everything that people want. Have you found a magic money tree, Mr. Johnson? And have you found perhaps more than one of them, Mr. Corbyn? <laughs> money forest, he's got. Uh, <laughs> Unless we Conservatives can win this argument about the non-existence of the magic money tree, we are in a very bad situation. The United so where's the, money, where's the money going to come from? Well, the money we were told to only two weeks ago there wasn't any. The money will have to come from the Treasury, it will have to come from within the existing... So maybe it's the needs of circumstance, the needs of the situation, which enabled, has enabled the Conservative Party to U-turn and effectively embrace the, the magic money tree. But there's, there's quite a lot of hypocrisy going on there. A tremendous amount of hypocrisy. And, you know, it's one thing to tap up the magic money tree when you need to. But it's another to tap it up 
effectively break capitalism because that's what they're doing. They're breaking that social contract to which you referred. They're breaking the essence of aspiration of the working and middle classes by devaluing the work that they've done and the savings that they've got. It's one thing doing all of that and then suddenly stopping and not doing enough or anything for that matter to unpick the problem that they've created for these people. You can't stop at that point. Having harvested the money, ma the magic money tree at the expense of all these people, you then have to have a programme to do social justice by them. Too. It's easy to point the blame at the Tories. Every government in the world is at it. Every to... major developed economy is sure. at it. You know, the poorer countries can't do it, of course. So no. they're also, you know... They get penalised a... in the foreign exchange market. Absolutely. So if you've got a kind of globalist view, you know, Pakistan, India, African countries, they're all being penalised. You know, we've lectured those countries for years about fiscal probity, and now we're fiscally completely and monetarily completely irresponsible, and they're getting and they're paying the price. <laughs> I was uh, I was watching exactly. I was watching an ad for the um, the Leeds Liquid Gold Building uh, uh, Bank account that you could get with the Leeds Building Society in the nineteen eighties, and it was an advert with Arthur Daly, George Cole. Remember George Cole, yeah. the actor, and. Um, George Cole was getting in, involved in all sorts of harebrained schemes, uh, you know, in order to make... A, and then he decided he was going to put his money in the Leeds because it was better than his harebrained schemes because the Leeds paid 9% interest. Yeah. Wow. Now the, wow. The, exactly, 9%. <laughs> now, you look at the equivalent account at the Halifax now. Yeah. The, Halifax, the Leeds was taken over by the Halifax. Yeah. The equivalent account at the Halifax pays 0.01%. Yeah. And so that gives you an idea of how the extent to which money has been debased. And it's going to have awful consequences. And it's not going to stop here. No. They're going to debase it further. Well, the next thing that's coming is um, negative interest Absolutely. rates. Absolutely. Where you are penalised for holding cash. And when you have central bank digital currencies and everyone will have a wallet or an account with the central bank, and through that account the central bank can pay you your furlough money, whatever it is, but they can also penalise you for, for holding, holding cash. cash. For holding cash. I, I was on the economics committee when I was a member of the European Parliament and we had Christine Lagarde come in and someone asked her about digital currency. And it was the first time in the interview her eyes lit up because through digital currency, she saw the ability to go ever deeper into negative interest rate territory because you can't withdraw your cash from the bank because there ain't no cash. So they can absolutely nail you and they can transmit that negative interest rate from the ECB into your bank account directly. So beware the direction of travel. Oh my goodness me. When future historians come to write the history of this time, one of the things they will talk about, which the world, you know, apart from a few nutty people who are into Bitcoin and gold, seem unable to see, is the rise of the central banker as a force of power, yeah. an unelected force of power. But their power over them, they wield extraordinary power. Extraordinary. Right, Ben, we're going to play uh, everyone's favourite game, Fantasy Chancellor. For the next three to four minutes, you have the role of Chancellor. I can see that little red satchel on the sofa <laughs> next to you. What are you going to do in the budget? How are you going to design our economy? Well, I would be doing everything I could to get businesses going forward, and giving consumers, particularly the working and middle classes, who, by the way, are the biggest consumers, giving them a sense of confidence, a sense of security and safety. So the big things I would do, and they're basically three things. I would cut taxes that hinder the activity of business. And by them, I mean VAT, business rates, national insurance on wages, tax on fuel, Tax on alcohol. OK, how much are you going to, are you going to cut these things? Well, by? these things, they produce about, in aggregate, those things produce about 350 billion a year for the government. And I would probably cut them by half across the board. I would utterly slash them. So back to 10%? I would cut VAT to 10%, maybe lower, particularly VAT, because I think it's an invidious tax on... It's a regressive tax. It hits the working class much harder than it hits the wealthy. You know, so I would cut it down to 10% uh, or lower. I would cut... It is simple. It is a simple tax. It's a simple tax, but I would still cut it. I would cut business rates dramatically. The physical world has been impacted hardest by the pandemic and lockdown, so I would cut business rates dramatically. That typically raises about 25 billion a year, so cut that in half. I would cut um, 
taxes on alcohol and fuel. Not because I want people to go out and get pissed, but I think if the hospitality sector, which is a really crucial component of our, of our economy, is to get going, it's not going to get going by f a five billion giveaway by the, by the chance. It's going to get going by people being able to trade profitably. And business rates is a big hindrance. So that's about 25 billion. Cut that in half. Wouldn't, it, isn't it, wouldn't you just rather no taxes, no intervention, let everyone get on with it, rather than deciding, oh, this, oh, okay. this thing needs a little bit I mean, of bail I mean, Dominic, money. you're absolutely right. Really, where we should go, and I'm glad you said, well, really where we should go is a simple flat tax, flat rate tax, and get rid of all the complexities. Absolutely. Cut £175 billion out of the tax take by cutting taxes across the board. But target those taxes, particularly that hit, that, that, that unfairly hit the working and middle classes. So many taxes are regressive. In fact, the vast majority are. They need to go. OK, so we've got VAT, fuel duty and uh, business rates. Yeah. Tax uh, on fuel, tax on alcohol. National insurance and income tax together? Uh, together? Well, national insurance particularly, because I want to get employment going. I want, okay. the, I want employers to be able to afford to take people on. And I would also really focus on the cost of travel. I know that's not really a tax, but it is a tax on the working class. You know, the average Londoner pays 18% of his wages on getting around London. And Sadi Khan is busy putting up tube fares, oh. busy putting up congestion charges. A lot charge. of the time, if there's two of you, it's cheaper to get an Uber than it is to go uh, on a is. tube. I know, it's cheaper. It's unbelievable. I do the same mental mass and I, get, I jump in an Uber. Um, so, you know, we've got to cut those. We've got to cut those, tops, uh, the, the, those costs, which are a tax on the people. So that's the first thing I would do. The other thing I would do, which I think is critical, as, as you rightly pointed out at the beginning of the programme, you know, unemployment is much higher than the 5% that they say. We've got 6 million people on furlough, 2 million of which haven't worked for at least six months. And furlough is not the answer. Continually kicking that can down the road is not the answer. We need to provide businesses with an incentive to take people on. We need a reverse furlough scheme. It would only cost a fraction of, the, of, of what furlough has cost, but if we could afford 14 billion a month on furlough, we can afford two or three billion a month to make sure that the people who've been in the crosshairs of the lockdowns are given an opportunity to go back to work and to work, and the businesses that employ them have an opportunity to be subsidised so they can trade their way back to profitability. So they're not wiped so you out would day one. people. you would subsidise the business to employ people rather than subsidise the, yeah. the employee. Yeah, and the, and the alternative is to watch these people be made redundant and the state picks up the tab anyway by way of the social safety net. I can see lots of dodgy scams and schemes going no on. No doubt. There. And no doubt money will be lost in the process. But and, and, and I, you, anyone who disagrees with me is forgiven because what I'm proposing is so unconventional. But, you know, we've had a year of totally unconventional government policy locking down businesses, preventing people from being able to work. We now owe it to them to give them an opportunity to get back to work. So I'd have something along those lines. OK, I'm going to propose, uh, as your deputy uh, chancellor, yeah. uh, your, what is it, undersecretary to the <laughs> treasury or whoever it is, will give you Milton Friedman, and, and he, this will be your motto. I am in favour of cutting taxes under any circumstances and for any excuse, for any reason, whenever it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So th that, that would be my second. Then. And the third thing, which costs the government absolutely nothing, is I would deregulate quite drastically. I would cut back employment law. I'd cut back all the European rubbish like GDPR, all of that. I'd cut uh, financial services regulations back tremendously. We're now effectively in a trade war with the EU in financial services. That is happening. We're not recognising the fact that we're in a trade war, but we are. And the best way to fight that war is to free up the city, cut the regulations back, cut the solvency too, cut MIFID, cut capital adequacy ratios for banks, and free up all that capital for us to compete aggressively. So it's a three-pronged thing. Cut taxes on business and consumers, um, uh, cut regulations, and give people a chance to get back to work. On that bombshell, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll end the programme there. Thank you very much for watching. It's been a pleasure having you here. I hope you've sat all the way through Ben and my rants and to Ben Habib and from me, Dominic Frisby, and from everyone here at Unlocked, we say thank you very much for watching. Down with Fishy Rishi and up with freedom. <laughs>